Okay, so grab your Bibles, guys and girls. Guys, meaning girls and guys. Okay, if you, if that makes sense. No, but seriously, if you believe this book to be true and Jesus is your Lord and Saviour, then let's say this with sincere hearts. This is my Bible. Holy and true like its author. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do in his strength what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And by grace, I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure it's something like that. So before I pray, today's message, I'm going to give you the title straight up, okay? And it's up there, okay? The title is, The Traditions of Men Versus the Commandments of God. Okay, so um, men meaning humanity, humans. All right, so the traditions of men versus the commandments of God. And of course, we're in Mark 7, 1 to 13. So let's pray. Father, we just uh, come to you now. And um, ask that you would give us humble hearts. Hearts that take your word seriously. Hearts that approach your word with faith knowing that it's totally reliable and trustworthy and Lord we need discernment today because you are showing us and you are warning us of something very disastrous that not just the Pharisees were plagued with but throughout church history um, churches have also fallen into this trap of elevating human traditions and laws equal and above the scriptures themselves and ultimately putting the word of God second and causing catastrophic effects within the church of God. So we just ask now that you would um, come and the word of God would be a, a, a razor sharp two edged sword that would dig deep into our hearts and expose the intents and the motives. And, and ultimately, you don't just expose our wrongward thinking and believing and valuing, but you also are able to transform. We ask that you'll do this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the last two weeks. We have beheld the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we've seen him do two miraculous miracles. One is taking five loaves and two fish and feeding thousands and thousands and thousands, 10 to 15, 10 to 15, 20, maybe 20,000 people. And that's glorious, isn't it? Absolutely glorious. And then we saw him walking on water and we behold his glory because it's recorded in the word of God. And, and just want to focus a little bit, just a short time by way of remembrance, that after he fed the miraculous, miraculous feeding, Jesus, remember, separates from his disciples. What was he doing on land? He was praying on land, on a mountain nearby, and that were with the 12 disciples. Where they were? They were in a boat, as William's pointing out, row, row, row your boat. They were rowing on the Sea of Galilee, making their way to Bethsaida. And in verse 48 of chapter 6, the following, Jesus sees them as they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. A ferocious headwind. And about... What time in the night did Jesus wait to come to them? 3 to 5 a.m. 3 to 5, 3 to 6 a.m., the fourth watch of the night. And he came on a surfboard, on a... What? Walking on water. On a jet ski. 
And, and it says that he, when he got there, he meant to pass by them. And, and, and what, what we learnt last week, and maybe more than likely this was Mark's intention, was that he used that wording to say that Jesus intentionally went to pass by them like the Lord God passed by Moses and passed by Elijah to display glory. He, went to, he meant to deliberately pass by them walking on water so that they would see glory like he would, they would see the glory of someone who can multiply five loaves and two fish. They'll, they'll see that this human being is radiating divine glory, God's glory. But verse, nine, verse 49 says, But when they saw him walking on the sea, they didn't see glory. They saw what they thought a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, literally I am, don't be afraid. So he not just displays his godness and his glory, he introduces himself saying, I'm here, I am he's here. And they should have said, of course, No one walks on water unless you are the I am. And verse 51, and he got into the boat with them. And just to give him more evidence, as soon as he hops in the boat, what happens to the wind? It stops straight away. Miracle. And they were utterly astounded. But unfortunately, they weren't astounded at glory. For Verse 52 says, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Though their eyes were opened, they saw sort of, didn't they? See, my proof has been that our hearts are not hardened in unbelief, okay? We need to be reminded, Christians, that even as Christians, we can harden our hearts in unbelief, causing you and I to be spiritually blinded to the glory of Christ. And... That, 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 and that my prayer has been that he has and he will continue to give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having our, the eyes of our hearts enlightened to his glory. Because this is the greatest solution to our greatest needs and problems. And just to give you two very short quotes as a reminder from last week, John Piper says, The healing of the soul begins by the restoring of the glory of God to its flaming, all-attractive place at the centre. Okay? This kind of seeing is the healing of our disordered lives, he says. So this week in chapter 7, the focus shifts away from the supernatural to Jesus' antagonist. Okay? He had, he had antagonist. And, and, and Jesus, in our context, is confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes, that's the teachers of the law, over the issue of eating with unwashed hands. Now, this is not the first time Jesus is bitterly confronted and challenged by these so-called directors of religion. So staying in Mark's Gospel, back in chapter 2, you may remember the paralysed man being lowered down in, you know, in the roof and by G, by in front of Jesus by his mates. And then Jesus responds to a heart of faith and before he restores his body in healing his pins, he restores his soul by forgiving his sins, okay? Now when some of the scribes who were in the overcrowded house heard Jesus say, son, your sins are forgiven. If you're a Christian and you, the moment you genuinely repent and put your trust in Jesus, Jesus declares, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Not just past sins, not just present sins, not just, but all sins are forgiven. And, they, and these scribes questioned in their hearts when they heard that and concluded in verse 7 of chapter 2 that Jesus was what? And they wrongly that he was a blasphemer, he was blaspheming because they rightly believe that God alone can forgive sins. You got that? 
Then again, just after this, Jesus again is questioned by these religious leaders. This time Jesus had, to, had just called a tax collector okay, by the name of Levi, which is actually Matthew in, in the 12 apostles, the one who wrote Matthew's gospel. And the Levi, to be his follower, and Levi, when he accepted the call of Jesus, invited people over for a meal to meet Jesus. And from his circle of friends, his immoral friends, tax collectors and sinners, probably prostitutes and other things they determine as sinners in that day. And what was the response of the scribes and Pharisees when they saw Jesus going to such a dinner with such a people? Why does he eat with such people? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And do you remember Jesus' response? Those who are well have no need of a doctor, a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, and, but sinners. There is no righteous. So Jesus came for everyone. This is all sin. Then again at the end of chapter 2, Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees about why he allowed his disciples to pluck, remember, heads of grain and to eat it on the Sabbath and They accused Jesus of allowing his disciples to break the Sabbath law. That's serious. And Jesus' response, because they actually didn't break the Sabbath law, Jesus' response is, in Mark 2, 27, 28, the Sabbath was made for who? For man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's a profound statement. That's an amazing statement. So just after this, Jesus deliberately heals a man, I love Jesus, heals a man on the Sabbath with a withered hand, remember? And it says in chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. How to kill him, how to get him off the face of the planet. These Pharisees and scribes not only saw Jesus as one having loose morals in regards to who he hangs around, but they saw him as lawless, as one who breaks the Sabbath and other laws they, they think he broke. And their rejection of Jesus comes to the high point in chapter 3, verse 22, where it says that some of the scribes came down from Jerusalem and were proclaiming, were claiming and proclaiming that Jesus is not on God's team, but he's on whose team? Satan's team. That they were accusing him of being possessed by Beelzebub. The Satan, the prince of demons. And after this, these antagonists are not mentioned in chapters 4, 5 and 6 until we reach our passage in chapter 7 where they question Jesus and make a serious public accusation about him. You got that? Firstly, they question Jesus about whether he allows his disciples to eat food with hands that were unwashed. Look at verse 1 and 2. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with hands that were defiled. Just, just, just sort of in your mind, underline defiled. That is unwashed. Unwashed hands to them meant defiled. They were defiled. And, and after this, they, they questioned Jesus... But see, as they question Jesus, the accusation comes out, which is cloaked in a question. Let's have a look at verse 5. So look for the accusation that's cloaked, covered up in a question. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? That's very upfront. See, they accused Jesus and his disciples of breaking the tradition of the elders and therefore defiling themselves, making them unclean. In other words, they accused them of sinning, got that? Of sinning by rebelling against the tradition of the elders. And so the question is, is this true? Did Jesus and his disciples 
sin before God and defile themselves by not washing their hands. And it needs to be said that this disagreement over washing hands has nothing to do with physical hygiene. Okay? Nothing to do with physical hygiene. But it has everything to do with spiritual and moral purity before God. So what did the law of God have to say about washing of hands? That's what we've got to ask. What did the Old Testament teach about the washing of hands? Now, back in Exodus, when the Lord was giving Moses instructions about making the tabernacle, listen to what the Lord says about this bronze basin that it, that it was meant to be made for washing, for ceremonial cleansing. So in Exodus 30, verse 17 to 21, check it out. It says, The Lord said to Moses, You shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. Now remember, it's not a bath. You don't put baby oil and bubble bath in it and stuff like that. It's nothing to do with that. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar and you shall put water in it with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a, f- a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. That's serious. This outward external ceremonial things was serious. They taught serious principles. So much so that if Aaron and his, the priests that followed him, if they neglected that, they die. And then he goes on to say, verse 21, They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and his offspring throughout their generations. So what does God command in respect to who should ceremonially wash their hands? Priests, only priests who are engaged in tabernacle service. So the law, the, oh, let me say this too, the law also allowed the priests to eat certain portions of the sacrifice, little lamb and bull and whatever, you know, they can have the little leg or whatever they, they, they eat, but they're, they're, they're given a certain portion of the sacrifice and they could share it with people in their own household, Okay. But this meant that according to Numbers 18, that all who ate the portion of the holy sacrifice, because it was regarded as holy, had to also go through the cleansing ritual to eat it. Okay? Now, the Pharisees' tradition extended these washing laws to everyone in the land, not just priests serving the temple. And you know the saying, a man's home, maybe the man's home is his castle? Maybe you haven't heard that one. Well, the Pharisees believed that a man's home was his temple. And it's important to make clear that the Pharisees and the scribes knew that the extension of the law of washing hands to all of God's people was not in the Old Testament scriptures. They knew that. They knew that it was part of the tradition of the elders. Now this tradition of the elders consisted of, back then anyway, of of unwritten laws that tried to fill the gaps and silences of the purity laws in Leviticus and Numbers. So you have laws in, in, in Moses, they're so detailed, but there are some things like, how do you apply that law to this part of life? You know what I'm saying? And so they, rabbis and all that would interpret that law and say, well, how is that relevant to this situation? And then they'll develop other laws to, make, to try to make it relevant and applicable. And by the time of Jesus, the Pharisees believed and most of the populace was taught to believe that these traditions were equal in authority to Scripture itself. That's the problem. Got that? They believed that these traditions of the elders and the laws in them was equal 
and to be treated as such as if they are holy scripture, given by God. Verse 3, look at verse 3. Mark puts a parenthesis um, to help Gentile readers like you and I who don't really understand the Old Testament too well, too well to understand what's going on here, or the culture. So read verses 3 and 4 with me and you'll see the, uh, the parenthesis that Mark puts in. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands holding to the tradition of the elders. But check out the Pharisees for the Pharisees and all the Jews. See that? This is just not the religious leaders. This is, they've taught that all the religious Jews are believing and holding to the same tradition and laws. Verse 4, And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that relate to the tradition of these elders, that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Okay, so now, so now this makes some sense why the Pharisees accused Jesus' disciples of defiling themselves. You got that? Making themselves unclean. So in the religious leaders' eyes, the disciples not washing their hands was a blatant act of defiance to God. And not just a, a defying human rules. Got that? So how does Jesus respond? Well, he doesn't just he doesn't justify or explain his disciples' behaviour, but he rebukes, he vilifies his challenges instead. So Jesus here is no defence lawyer for the for the uh, disciples, but he's a prosecutor against those who should know better. So look at verses six to eight. Foot with me. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, Did well, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This, this people honours me. Now he's quoting a quote from Isaiah. This people honours me with their lips, but their hearts are, the heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. See, we need to understand... Jesus' scathing rebuke of these leaders was, a, was in light of their public challenge in order to shame Jesus. You got this? This open Jesus, why do your disciples wash their hands and defile themselves? Don't wash, their hands, wash, don't wash their hands and defile themselves. That was purposeful to shame Jesus, to make him look like an incompetent Where's the words? Untrustworthy teacher of God. You got that? It's to make him look bad. So Jesus, without fear or favour, and I believe in love for them, the Pharisees, and love for the people they're corrupting, exposes these leaders' rigid and superficial religiosity. Though the Pharisees wrongly accuse disciples of defiling themselves, Jesus rightly accuses the Pharisees for being hypocrites. Now, let me just try to give you a, fla- give you a flavor of what I think, sort of in my own words, what Jesus is saying. You ready? I don't care how religious or righteous you or others think you are. You are pretenders. You are just like the people of Jerusalem that Isaiah prophesies about his day. Pretenders. Those who sought to honour God through their many and familiar words, but their hearts were a stranger to God like yours are, hypocritical Pharisees. Their worship of God was vain. It was useless because they held, sorry, it was useless because it was heartless, like yours is. Their relationship with God was worthless, like yours is, because they held to the traditions of men and taught others as if these traditions from men were doctrines of God. This is what you do. You enforce a law 
that people need to wash their hands and if they don't, you make them feel morally dirty and spiritually defiled. See, that's, that's the sort of flavour that Jesus was talking. You got that? So, beloved of God, let me say this. Jesus' response here to hypocrisy should cause you and I to fear and to take the rebuke of the Pharisees very seriously. Why? Who here has not given lip service in our worship of God? Because our hearts have been far from him. Who can say that, you know, we, we have all at times come to church to worship and it is in vain because it is heartless. So let's get to the heart of the matter for these hypocritical, vain worshippers. Look at verses 8 and 9. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way, you are experts, of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. In other words, you leave, you abandon the commandment of God. This is serious. You Ultimately, he says, you reject the commandment of God by doing this. Because you want to treat man-made traditions like they are God-inspired commands. See, Jesus is teaching that you cannot serve two masters here. You cannot serve God's word and human traditions. You will either love and hold to one and hate and reject the other. So Jesus in verses 2, 10 to 12 continues by giving the Pharisees a specific example of their hypocrisy. Let's read it, verses 10 to 13 actually. For Moses said, Honour your father and your mother, and whoever revolves father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would, you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, dedicated to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have have handed down and many such things you do. So the word of God, listen to this, is made void, in other words, is made ineffective. The word of God is made ineffective in our lives and in our churches if we hold to traditions as if they are the very word of God. That's serious. Let me try and explain this example that may be hard for us to understand due to cultural differences. See, God commands children to honour their parents. True? Is that in the Bible? Is that a, is that a command of God? Children, honour your parents. Yeah. And in first century Jewish culture, that entailed more than just showing them respect. It also required children to provide their ageing parents with physical necessities. Many cultures today still have this. See, this is understandable in a culture where there was no aged care facilities, no pension, no superannuation. The children were the super. So in the example Jesus used... The Pharisees followed and taught that if a son dedicated to God money or material goods that could be used to support their parents, these goods cannot be touched in order to help them. The end result is that the child, the the adult child, obeys this human tradition called Corban and gets out of doing something the Lord actually commands him to do. Got that? Hypocrisy. The human tradition has overrided, has made void God's commandment and has produced a hypocrite because of it. And the sad thing is that Mark writes at the end of verse 13, look at it, many such things they do. This is not the only tradition they treat as scripture. Now, I want to do, what, what I want to do now is for us to draw out some principles that this passage teaches, reflect on the relevancy for us, and seek to apply, okay? So, 
Before we do, let me read you a quote from an evangelical scholar. And uh, he says this, David Garland in his Mark commentary writes this word of warning. In interpreting this passage, we should be careful not to belittle first century Judaism as a dead letter, a wash in legalism, when our own Christianity can be just as dead and just as legalistic. Judaism is the name for the Jewish religion, okay? Christians also add traditions to the essentials of the faith, apply them legalistically and treat them as if they have been ordained forever by God. They feel no less troubled or angry than the Pharisees did in Jesus' day when anyone challenges or undermines them. So you go up to these people who have made a certain tradition, God's word, and you say, that's not in God's word. And they get all angry and get all huff and puffy. And, but that's how we've always done it. That's, we're Baptists. That's what Baptists do. We're Presbyterian. And so you'll see in the sermon outline a, 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 a gap for us to ask, what traditions do we have in our church and in our lives? Now, so we're going to save that to the end. We're going to spell, allocate some time to either you type, think about what traditions we have. Now, we all have a culture, but can I say this? Sometimes, let me just, the Chinese church have the added cultural traditions that can either contradict the Bible or make, or they place that cultural tradition equal with the Bible. And you just got to see if one of you guys don't do that tradition, how people respond. You got that? So this is serious. This is serious for my culture. It's serious for the Asian culture. I'll give you some examples of, of church cultured things. Okay? Baptism. How do we baptise? Does it have to be in a lake? Does that, can it be in a pool? You know what I'm saying? Now, if the church has done it always in the lake forever and ever and ever, and someone says, let's do it in the pool, oh, no, we've always done it in the lake. Or, or um, communion. What size bread do we use? What type of bread do we use? Do we use wine? Do we use red juice? How often do we have communion? So the church chooses. The Bible doesn't say. It just says use red juice and bread. And, and the thing is, it doesn't say how often we should do it. So the church has to choose. Do we do it monthly, weekly? And when the church chooses, we do the, set this pattern of tradition. And all of a sudden, the pastor, the new pastor comes in and says, guys, I think we should do it weekly. No, oh, we can't do that. That's wrong. You see? So the thing is, we've just music type. Let me get on the music. Type of instruments. Does the Bible say that drumming's bad? It actually says they use drums in the Old Testament. They use string instruments. So the question is, we'll talk more about that issue in a second. Type of songs, benediction, um, or the, the, the also giving. Does the Bible say should we tithe, give ten percent of our gross income or our net income? I think the Bible teaches that we should tithe, but I don't think it teaches whether it should be gross or net, before tax or after tax. So we've got to decide. Now, if I stood up and said, I think it should be gross, I'm not saying that's my view, and then all of a sudden we make it legal, that it's just a belief that SMCC believe, and that's a tradition, isn't it? And all of a sudden, that tradition gets cemented as treated like a scripture. Or certain dress wear. Or certain hairstyles or facial hair. So think about the traditions. You need to think about this. So I'll give you three brief points and I'll give you time to reflect on what traditions we may have. Okay, so the first point is 
what I get in from Jesus, from this passage, from Jesus is, number one, Christianity is not against tradition. You got that? We need to see clearly that in this passage that Jesus does not reject tradition. As such, societies need tradition to function. David Stern, in his Jewish New Testament commentary, writes something very fitting. Hopefully you'll get it. He says this, A state, that's a political state, A state cannot be run by a constitution without legislation. You got that? Likewise, the Jewish nation cannot be run by the written Torah, that's the name for the law, alone. Without the orderly application of it, and in addition to it, implied in addition to it, implied the concept of tradition. So you need to be able to apply the laws and say, how is that relevant to that circumstance? And then traditions and processes come in place. It's not wrong. And then he says, but just as a country's legislation cannot contradict or supplant its constitution, so too tradition cannot violate or alter. God's word. So tradition has its place as long as it doesn't contradict God's word and it doesn't be, is not treated as equal with God's word. Okay, so like the Jews has the, had the tradition of the elders, Christian communities, we have oral traditions that try to fill the gaps and direct believers on the precise, on what precisely they should do and should not do. Okay, and we've talked about a few of them. So let me just try to highlight some reasons why we do this, okay? One is churches will sometimes stress one thing or, an or another to reinforce their identity over and against others that are not good. Um, sometimes, let me try to, uh, that's not very clear. Let me say this again. Sometimes the stress, this is who we are will be on a particular practice or sometimes a distinctive doctrine. So in holding to this, react, this react, reactive tradition, they want to make clear that they are this kind of people and not like them, whoever them may be. And um, this is the example of musical instruments I was trying to get to, okay? I think churches over the years have said, we don't want guitars and drums and all that is because they see worldly rock music out there that is not good and therefore we react against that and we, we take an instrument that is wonderful and say that's wrong. You see? So it's a reaction to people who may use those instruments in an ungodly way and therefore we make the instrument itself bad. And that's wrong. Because what happens is, you haven't read the Psalms. The Psalms is full of all sorts of instruments. We should have trumpets and, you know, brass instruments and string instruments and harps and, you know what I'm saying? We should be, make a loud noise, crashing cymbals. <laughs> Might override my bad singing, but see, and you know, when, what happens too is, this is the unfortunate thing is, um, so let me just say this Jesus knew that we need wine skins using a different analogy that we looked at earlier in Mark Jesus knew that we need wine skins forms and traditions to hold the wine otherwise we will be standing in a puddle full of juice see he warned he warned only about wine skins traditions that become old and brittle and no longer serve their intended purposes you got that? Traditions become evil when they run counter to God's purposes expressed in his word. So Jesus is not against tradition. He's against the human tendency to make human traditions either to contradict God's word or they are elevate them to be given the same authority as God's word and equal to scripture. And when you do that, human authority becomes first the, the tradition and God's word is relegated to second. In actual fact, it's made void, ineffective. So number point two, Christianity is about the supremacy of God's word. And that's what we've been saying. The comparison has been God's word, God's commandments versus human traditions and human 
humans' words and laws. In verse 8, you, you leave the commandment of God, you leave it and hold to, to the traditions of men. Verse 9, you reject the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition, your tradition. And verse 13, you make void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, your human tradition. Okay? Now, why do we do that? Two things. Why churches in history, and this has happened in history, guys. If you study church history, you've got to understand that there's a reformation that needed to happen in the 1500s because the church went totally off the scale, went wayward. Okay? Now, what happened there was we can fall into traditionalism, into believing these certain traditions are, you know, the be-all and end-all. We treat them like scripture, treat them as if they're from God if we just don't read the Bible. If we neglect the Bible. See, in the Middle Ages, the Bible was only in, in the original languages or Latin. And most people didn't know Latin, didn't know Greek, didn't know Hebrew. They knew, they knew English. And there was no Bible. And the Catholic priests knew Latin and some intellectuals knew. And they could read the Bible in Latin. But the general people didn't. And they were deceived to believe in all sorts of human traditions. And when, the, when God used certain men like Tyndale and others to get to a, 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 a Bible in English, people started to read the Word of God and start to say, why do I believe that? It's not in the Bible. Why are we taught this? Why does the Catholic Church do this? And then, of course, God used Martin Luther to bring about and others to bring about the Reformation. So... It needed to happen. It was getting back to the Bible as the supreme authority that we govern our life and the way we govern our churches. And we just got to not, we just got to neglect the Bible and we will fall into believing all sorts of things. And also, I think the other way is we just distort the Word of God. So the Pharisees missed the main purpose of the Scriptures. They took God's law and believed that they could do God's law in their own strength, in their own righteousness, and get good enough to earn favour with God and go to heaven. They're full of pride and they thought that if they just... And so their idea of precise getting all the details of God's external law right, they could just control God so well and his law, they could just tick, 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 and all of a sudden they feel self-righteous and they've pleased God. So they took the gospel of grace and distorted it so we, we can do that too and you will find people who don't get grace people who have not understood the gospel and they read the bible they see it very differently don't they so number last point is that christianity is about the heart and not about externalism okay verse six and seven quoting Isaiah, he says this people honors me with their lips but their hearts are far from me in vain do you worship me That's, do you want to worship God in vain? I don't. I don't want to get to the end of my life and he'll say, I didn't, never knew you. You did all this external stuff outwardly, but inwardly there was no true worship. There was no true change, transformation, no true, lo true love for God. You weren't truly wanting to honour God. You were just doing like the Pharisee, doing outward things to make them look good before people, to try to fit in and fit, and just, just to live by my parents' expectations and make, keep them happy, live for their honour and not for the honour of God. And in actual fact, this idea of defilement, Jesus, next week we're going to look at this in verse 15, defilement, what makes us unclean is not just because we don't wash our hands. You can go home and you can scrub your hands and scrub your whole body as much as you want. But our defilement goes, our sin goes deep to the heart. That's the issue. And so the only answer, the only answer, listen to Psalm 24, 3 and 4. The psalmist says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Who can stand in the holy presence of God? 
He says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, clean hands means that a clean life, living. Hands means doing. Heart means motive, intention, and all that. Okay, so it's not washing your hands again. Okay, so you need to be holy to be through and through from the inside out to be able to be in God's holy presence. You need to have a pure, you need to be pure in order to be in God's pure presence. You need to be righteous in order to be in God's righteous presence. And can you do that? No way. That's why Jesus and the gospel, Jesus is the answer. He's our purity. He's our righteousness. He's the one who can cleanse us and wash away our impurities and our defilements. You got that? He alone. No attending church. No giving to the poor. Nothing can make that defiled heart, which Jesus is going to talk about next week. I'll talk, let Jesus speak through. Um, cleanse us. Like the Pharisees thought. We need Jesus. We need his salvation. So, before I pray, let me pray. Finish what I'm going to say. And I'm going to let you have some time to ask questions and write down traditions. Since only quarter past two. Um, So let's pray. Father, we just ask now. SMCC sincerely, sincerely wants to do things that honour you. And so the end result is we don't want individually and as a church to, for our life and our worship of you to be vain, worthless, useless. Lord, we want to be sincere. We want to be genuine. We want true cleansing we want, tr- we want true transformation from that inward out and um, we don't want to worship and lift up human traditions and therefore reject the word of God so show us Lord help us to be lovers of your word so that we may discern when we're doing that so we can discern error as well as what is from you and not from you as well. So give us wisdom in this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want you to do for five minutes, you can discuss it with someone next to you. Sometimes... um,